Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. We'll soften those blows. It'll get you on the right track. So work in that direction of changing your mind and your thinking, but that's not enough. You will set in motion a generational chain reaction. The sins of the father pass down the next generation. The heartache you will cause to your parents, your family, your peers, your mentors, and those of you that are in some form of ministry, even lay leadership, those that you're discipling. It'll be terrible. So the first of all, it's going to enslave. Secondly, it'll shatter a life usually more than one. Number three, it has the real probability of a social disease. Now, this message can go on and on, and I don't want it to, so the social disease issues are going to be put up online for those of you that would like to get it. I'm not going to read through all of them. I have some latest statistics that may or may not make the, uh, the website, but I'd like to give these to you because some relate to Hawaii, all right? Social disease. Kids, do you know what I'm talking about that? STD. You know what STD stands for? sexually transmitted disease. Now, I know we're talking about spiritual and relationship and intimacy with God, but I have to tell you that I serve the Lord with my flesh. shouldn't serve Him in my flesh, but I do serve Him with my flesh. And so I want to be the healthiest guy that I can be to serve God. And if I can ward off any type of, of problems to my health, I will do that. And sexually transmitted disease is rampant. The latest statistics I was able to get in my research said that Hawaii is number six in the nation of all 50 states. Number six with chlamydia. One in five people in the U.S. already has an STD. Now, I don't want to scare you, but you could look around here and count every five person, go to the next one, STD. Not exactly that person, but you know what I'm saying. Two-thirds of all STDs occur in people 25 years of age or younger. I got this statistic from the American Social Health Association. Now, there's more statistics, but I'm only going to give you those. It's rampant wherever we go. And the likelihood of getting it is very, very high. And the results and the trying to clear it up and clean it up is not always that promising. And then next, what it'll do about the uh, problems in our life besides the social disease is there's always the potential of pregnancy. You can talk all about the oral part of it. You can talk all about the outside. And I'm going to do all the protective things that I can. But there's always that potential for pregnancy. Elizabeth Elliot. She wrote to teenagers and she put it this way, and I'm reading from her article called Sex is a Lot More Than Fun. She says, You might have a baby you didn't mean to have. Would you know what to do with him or her? If you can't take care of him or her yourself, can you imagine what it's like to give him or her up? Now, in our culture here in the island for a moment, let me speak to us local folks. We generally don't abort. Now, there's a lot of that going on. I don't want to minimize that. And the pro-life people here, I support you a thousand percent. But the culture is that the baby is there. Give it to grandma and grandpa. The, uh, the village will raise the person kind of a thing. If you understand what I'm saying, can you at least say, uh-huh? All right. And so generally, we don't feel the pain any longer because, hey, we have the kids. Somebody else will take care of it. Why? Because they did that for me. I was one of those. My other one, my cousin was. My tutu was. We all were like that. So, hey, we just bring another kid in the world. It's, it's, the, it's the, the highest level of a pet we can have. I don't mean to minimize humanity, creating the image of God, but that's kind of like what's going on in a lot of families. And so because of that, the kid then is raised by, reared by the, the mother, the father, the grandmother, whomever it might be. But the kid, because it's still a kid, goes out and socializes as long as someone else is there to take care of the kid. Feed the kid, bring up the kid, take the kid to school, bring the kid home from school, take him to soccer practice. And, uh, but then give the kid back when the mama really wants to have the kid for a while so she can show him off and I'm still a good mom and all that. But I can't do it. So give it. Now we do need to do that because what else do we want to do? Put him out on the street? No, we don't want to do that either, but it does happen. And so pregnancy occurs. I'm not finished yet. She goes on to say, you might decide you have to have an abortion. Do you like that idea? Think about the money it's going to cost, the pain you'd have to go through. Think about that little baby you're aborting. She didn't say this last part. I put this in. Think about what it does, though, with your relationship with God. The plumbing is there, so kids are going to happen. God permits it, but He doesn't prescribe it that way at all. But what does it do to your relationship? Your whole life is changed. Those are some of the causes. Let me give you two more. It will cause guilt. 
Your inner peace will be gone. Prayer will be hindered. Inability and barrenness will actually come into your life so bad that you will lose all stability at that moment. It will damage your testimony. We talked a lot about that. And finally, it will cause financial stress. Let me just kind of frame this for all of you that have been reading the newspapers. You found some of these politicos that are out there that have had moral impurity and now you're finding how much money they've used, either family members or others, and where they got the money is being investigated. But money is involved in, number one, covering it up. What they don't tell you is how much money was spent while it was going on to keep it going. How much money was spent to start it. And then let me read you this statistic. How much money is spent once an STD is given to someone. STDs cost people in the United States about $8 billion to diagnose and treat. So besides just having another affair going on and all that goes on and the money you spend online, the money you spend in magazines, the videos, the DVDs, the things you do on television, the things that you watch at the movies, all of that. And I'm not against going to movies or having DVDs. Uh, you understand what I'm saying. I, th- I think you're mature enough to know where my heart is on this. I'm not a legalist. I would just hope that we would be people that would want to be righteous and holy like he is. So there's money involved. So what should I do? I, I got this issue. What, what can I do? Let me give you these and then we'll end up with our action points and close. You've been very patient with me and I thank you for it. Again, this message is longer online and you can get it. What can I do to demonstrate? Number one, virtue should be the very first trait to have after you trust Christ as Savior. So I'm going to speak to those of you right off the bat that have trusted Christ. We baptized some last week. We had a lady come to faith in my office just a week ago. And uh, she's celebrating her faith. She gave me a wonderful card. And she's quoting John, 1 John 5.13. And she sent me another note just saying how God's changed your life. I'm not speaking to her directly, but speaking to people like her directly. And that is, is, once you trust Christ, if you want to know where do I start first, work with virtue. Where do I get that? Scripture says to do that. Here's what it says. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life, godliness, and through the knowledge of Him who called us by His glory and virtue. But also for this very reason, give all diligence. Here it is. Add to your faith virtue. Now, you don't do virtuous things to get saved. You're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone. Boom, you're saved. Now you have the power source and the reason, the potential for purity. Now, once you do that, though, you're going to add to that faith. All right, if I've got to clean something up, the first thing I do is I'm going to quit sleeping around. I'm going to quit having thoughts that are morally impure. I'm going to remove from my house the things that are temptable to me that will bring me into moral impurity. I am going to do what is virtuous. So the very first thing I do is that. And now, let me, I'm not, I won't be mystical with God. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball with God in the center of it. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm wondering if the reason he says add to your faith virtue and he started with that verse instead of all these others is because if we deal with virtue, the other stuff often takes care of itself. I don't know that yet. I haven't had enough time to meditate and run this through the grid of Scripture, but you take that home and think about it. That maybe there's a lot of other things you're wrestling with, but it all comes back to, watch this, virtue. Now stay with me. And maybe you're even now saying, I've been working with my virtue and I'm not very good at it. Maybe you've got to take it one more step back. And that's going to be in the area of, have you trusted Christ as your Savior yet? Have you really put your faith alone in Christ alone? And maybe that's where you're struggling. All right, the second point. Virtue should characterize godly women. So you women that say, you know what? I want to be godly. I want to be the poster child of godliness. I still struggle. I still have weaknesses. I still lose my temper. I have some problems. But I want to be godly. You're in a good camp. Ruth is one of many. And then secondly, in godly men like the one Solomon admonishes. And there's a whole bunch of passages there for you to read. And I don't have time to go through them. But they are rich and easy to understand. You don't need to have a commentary to understand these. They're easy to understand. That characterizes you, godly women. Here's a question for you. Do you want to be godly, ladies? This is a place to begin. Men, you want to be godly? This is a place to begin. Third one, be focused on it in order to bring peace. Some of you that don't have a lot of peace, it could be because you're trying to have peace, but at the same time, you're dragging along behind you the ball and chain of moral impurity. And you got all this stuff going on inside of you and you're struggling and you want to know, how come I don't have the peace that I should have? It's because you still have moral impurity. You are not virtuous. So think about the things that will bring that to your life. Action steps. You have it for you, in front of you. Would you take out your notes? I'm not sure if it'll be on the screen or not. It may be. But if you will, look on your notes for a second. I did not put blanks in there for you to fill in because I didn't want you to miss anything. This is for those of you that are ready to say, I've been in this, Pastor. How do I get over this thing? What do I do to get this thing changed? 
The very first thing you need to do is to say to yourself, and it's not a number one on this, but the first thing you need to say is, you know what, Pastor? I needed a checkup from the neck up, and Pastor, you brought that to me from the Word today. I want to I wanna tell you that the Spirit of God is working on my heart, Pastor, and I want to be this. And I'm telling you, if you don't want to deal with this, you will deal with it. It'll ha- you'll deal with it sometime in your life, but those of you that want to have the faster course, deal with it now. Next thing you want to do is to make sure you receive Christ as your Savior. So you look at your life and you can say this, Lord, I am a sinner. We all are sinners in every area. Today we're talking about moral impurity. So in your mind, all you have to do is look at any time in your life, young people, everybody, old people, whoever you are, all the way back. If you had moral impurity, even if you're not doing it now, if you had it then, that was a sin. You know it? That sin right there brought the moral ruin of the human race in a sense. That is that sin that you have that now you've been polluted and you need forgiveness. And so whether you've done that and some of you says, no, I've never had an immoral thought. I never lusted after a woman. I never lusted after a man. I never did something that was unbiblical in my moral life. Well, I'd like to shake your hand. Would you come up afterwards? Carol will probably go home early today. But anyway, it's going to be like that. There's, everybody struggle with that. So we're all sinners. I'm one too, okay? So now that we had that, we all need a Savior. And so now we go to him and say, Lord, you are the great forgiver of all sin. You forgave me of my sin and my thought, talk, and walk. You've died on the cross. You paid my sin debt. You've washed that sin away. You've cast it in the sea of forgiveness. You rose again from the dead. And now you offer to me eternal life so I could be clean and pure and worship you. And so he'll forgive you. But if you don't do that, first of all, you not only won't go to heaven, you will not have an intimate relationship with Christ. Could never have one because you're not his child. And finally, you have no power to deal with this thing that you know that's already been racking your brains right now. You've been wanting to get out of it, but you've been enslaved in it. And I want to tell you, there is not only hope, but there's promise for victory. I know. Let's go on. Look at my list here. So make up your mind now to be different than the world. You don't have to be weird than the world. You're just going to be different than their world thinking. Remove from you all temptation of moral impurity. Such as, young people, I want you to look at my list, if you will. And I love you, and I don't think any of you are doing anything wrong, okay? But just look at it. Lonely places, parked cars, empty houses with no one home, dimly lit rooms, walks at night on the beach with just the two of you. Watch out for those kinds of things because that's kind of a fertile ground for moral impurity. Watch out for books, magazines, videos, movies, computer porn, music, etc. Number four, beware of morally impure thoughts. What you think about, you'll become... So watch your thinking. Take your thoughts. When you start thinking, and it's going to happen because we're all, we're all been in it. We live in a cesspool of moral impurity, so we are going to get a little morally impure thinking going on in our head. It's normal. It's natural. But God says we're to be supernatural. Do you hear an amen on that? We're to be supernatural. So what you do now is you now go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I'm going to take that thought down. It is trash, and I'm going to throw it down into a trash can of my mind. I'm going to take that, and I'm going to throw it in the garbage of my mind. I'm, I'm getting rid of that thing right there. Every time it comes, you do that. Watch it, watch it. It's going to sound so weird, but the more you do that consciously, you're going to find that your conscious life will then give way to your subconscious mind, and your subconscious will be doing it so often by then that you won't have the same amount of struggle that you had when you first started. Ask me. Next, maintain a wide circle of friends, but especially avoid sensually arousing people. Bad company does corrupt corrupt good manners. Now, when we often preach that, we would say, watch out for your buddies, watch out for your girlfriends. They're going to talk the sex talk. They're going to talk about sleeping. They're going to talk about their conquests. They're going to talk about who's doing it with whom. We all agree with that. But may I bring you another circle of people that you have? Those would be the ones that when you watch the movies, the DVDs, all that stuff, you don't know them personally, but they are real people. They're virtual people, we might say, in the virtual world, but they're still bringing that damnable communication of moral impurity to you and me. So watch out about that stuff. Don't say don't go to movies. I didn't say that you can't watch DVDs. I'm just saying pick and choose. You know my mantra. Good, better, best. Never let it rest till your good is better and your better is what? Best. And so choose. Next, don't lie down in the per- presence of another person. Don't touch another person, especially to arouse them sexually. For singles, and I know we have some here, have your parents or your special friend Meet and approve your friends. Plan your dates ahead of time and stick to the plans. Go by your better judgment and don't ever date a Christian, only a dedicated Christian. And I would like to caution you maybe even to think about dating and think more about perhaps courting. Number eight, for married people, that would be people like Carol and me. Continue giving your mate assurance of your commitment. 
Carol needs that, especially for me. I need it from her. Last Sunday, we had a very busy day. Last Monday, Herb and Barb and I, we watched the wedding of Barb's daughter, most godly, godly vow they made to each other. And the very next day, Herb and I then went and we did with Carol and and Barb, we did a, a vow renewal of a couple that had been married for 14 and a half years in marriage. They've been in ministry together, served the Lord, they loved the Lord. They recommitted themselves to each other. And I got thinking how neat. You do it at the altar and you do it again. Every year when I marry a couple on their first anniversary, Carol and I put together a very special anniversary card reminding them that commitment that they made the year before on their first anniversary. That's what we need to do with each other. The second is we need to cultivate a spirit of intimacy. Often we get more intimate with the outside is because somehow the intimacy has fallen apart with the inside of our relationship. Number nine, think think past the present. There's always going to be payday someday. And then finally, number 10, if you begin to weaken, I love this. When you begin to weaken, you cry out to God. My dad taught me how to swim. Maybe that's why I like the water so much. My dad was a waterman. And I remember the time that I was about ready to drown and my dad was right there and I was so scared for that moment as he was teaching me that I thought I was going down and I'm one of those guys that I don't need anybody. You know that already. So I've had to learn over the years that I do need people. I still struggle with that because my, my nature is a you know, competitor type. But I remember as a little kid, I said, Oh, Dad, Dad, help me. I'm drowning. Ah! You know, I was scared. I was sucking in water, sucking in air. Didn't know where my dad was. My eyes were all burning with the salt. It was crazy. And my dad was right there. Right there. I was glad that my dad was there because he gave me a model of 40, 50 years ago that when you cry out to God, he's right there. And may I suggest, cry out to God sooner than you usually cry out to God. When you're starting to feel tempted to hit that button on the computer. God help me! What's not in your notes is to get into an accountability group and have them ask you the tough questions. Give them the freedom to do that but then make sure you tell them the truth. Virtue is not a gift, it's a decision. Folks, I really love you. I want to come down here for a moment, then I'm going to pray and turn it on over to the the rest of the team to close up. I really do care for you. I I don't know if you're struggling with this right now. Don't pack up, don't pack up. Just listen. I I I don't know if you're struggling with this. No one has emailed me. No one says, Pastor, would you speak on this issue? I just know that this part of our life, this virtue thing and the lack thereof, is so real and it can have such an effect on your decision making from how you spend your money to the decisions that you make and where you're going to work and where you're going to live with your kids it is it is so it's like a tentacle it's like a net all around you this moral impurity and i love you i know that you struggle with it i struggle with it but it's a winnable war even dobson wrote stuff like that and there are people in this room as i look that are winning the war. I can't say they won it because next week we might lose it. Hope not, but we're winning it today. And I want you to be a part of the winning team. Would you accept the payment Christ made on the cross, receive his divine nature inside of you of all that purity, and then with that, use his eyes, ears, and heart and look back at all that junk and see what it is. It's nothing more than nails that nail Jesus to the cross. All that stuff was a nail and a hammer because Jesus went to the cross to pay for that sin. And he says, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean you up and give you a whole new life here and eternity in heaven with me there. But you've got to come to me just as you are, lost in need of Christ. I did. Carol did. And dozens of others in here have. And I want you to come with us on the journey, will you? our journey with God, and our journey with the winnable war on purity. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. I will not deceive you or to tell you that those of you that have failed and have had a failure in your life, that you won't have scars any longer. I can promise you that those scars won't bleed any longer when you come to Christ and you allow His purity to be lived out through you, you exchange that. But the neat thing is, it's not over. You still have a word. You still have an opportunity. You still have a life. 
So some of you that feel like it's so bad, you're so guilty, it's just you've, you've lost it all, and you're going to give it up and say, I, I don't want to be a part, I can't do this. I want you to know, don't take that defeated attitude. Satan wants to keep you in that hell hole. Simply come to him just as you are and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm going to come to you. I want, I, I, I want you as my Savior. I know you are the Lord. I know you're the master of everything. But Father, I'm trusting you as the one who died and rose again on the cross. And I believe that that's it. And now as I come to you, I want to thank you for your full forgiveness of my sin. I know that it's not by my good works. I know it's not going to be by me forsaking my moral impurity, although I ought to do that. But it is by me coming to you just as I am, a sinner in need of a Savior, humbly and broken and desperate. And I'm coming to you just like that, Lord. Afterwards, I want you to help clean me up. I want you to, I want you to take over my life. Afterwards, I want you to make it the way you want it to be. And I'm gonna, I'll pay the price, Lord, whatever it takes. Whatever things have to change in my life, it is okay because I'm on the journey with you and you're smiling and you're there with me. But right now, I'm coming to you just as I am and I want to walk through the door of Jesus Christ and salvation. Now, my friend, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to pray for you. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand. Now, raising your hand won't save you. Me praying for you won't save you. I'm not going to have you walk an aisle or come forward. I love you. I care for you. But getting into God's family, the forgiveness of all your sin, having a new life in Christ, that's a personal, intimate thing right now just between you and Him, first and foremost. After that, make it as public as you can. But to get into His family, the birth is private between you and Him. If you are accepting Christ as your personal Savior, as the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again, and you'd like for me to remember you in prayer, would you slip up your hand and put it down right now? Put it up. Put it down. Is there anyone at all? Okay, those of you who are listening on the radio or maybe perhaps um, listening or off the, uh, the, the download, if you want to email me, and I'll keep whatever you say private and together we'll pray and we'll, I'll, I'll try to help you get through this thing. All I'm going to do is just point you to Christ and some verses and you and him will work it out. But it'll be worked out. Let me be a part of that with you, okay? Don't, don't go through it alone. I'll be, I'll be your friend. If you're a woman and you're hearing me right now, my wife would be glad to sit there and talk to you and, and do it privately. If you don't want to give your name, you want to do it just kind of, you know, real confidential, we'll give you our phone number. She'll give you her personal cell number. Whatever we can do to help. Now let me change this for a moment. For those of you who know Christ as Savior, and I'm speaking to our young people too, if you already know you're going to heaven and you'd like to have prayer because you want to be that godly woman, you want to be that godly man, you want to be that valiant man and that strong woman in moral purity, I'd like to pray for you. My hand is up, so already assume that. I want you to pray for me. I do not want to embarrass you by having a moral failure in any way. Obviously, I don't want to embarrass Christ. But you're also my ohana here. And I love you. And so you pray for me. But now I'd like to pray for you. How many of you would like to have prayer that God spoke to you and there are things in your life that you have got to change and you know that you're going to trust God for the strength and you want me to pray for you now? Is there anyone? Would you put up your hand right now? Is there anyone at all? Thank you. Thank you. A lot of hands. I'm not going to record your hand, go up to my office and see who raised their hand and who didn't. That's a personal thing between you and the Lord. And whether or not I pray for you, you still got a job to do. So go in. Go in grace. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for your forgiveness and your mercy, how that you give us all these opportunities to have a do-over. But for some, they've wrestled with this so long that they need to have a defining moment. And I pray that it's today. I pray that it's right here in Honolulu. I pray it's a result of the Word of God changing the heart of the child of God for the glory of God. And so, Father, I pray that today is the first day of purity in their life. And then, Father, I pray that you'll help all of us that when we are tempted, that we will cry out unto you and that you'll reveal back to us that your life is inside of us and we let you live it out through us. So we now depend upon that exchange life experience. 
Now, Father, I pray because of what we've heard at the very beginning that the world will glorify you if they come to faith in Christ to do that and they will more likely come to faith in Christ if they hear it from the lips of someone who's living the pure life. And so, Lord, let it be us in a bigger thing of eternal kingdom building. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Make it clear.